Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Morning everyone. Uh, so welcome to this session on the importance of trees for resilient livestock systems. My name is uh, Jo Smith, I'm an agroforestry researcher and I worked for, gosh, 10 years or so at the Organic Research Centre with Lindsay, um, leading the agroforestry programme there. Now, three years ago, I moved to southern Portugal, um, still working on agroforestry, but obviously in a very, very different climate, more like what we've got here today. And actually, you have me to thank for this weather because I brought it with us. Um, but there, you know, it, the importance of trees for, for uh, buffering extremes of, of weather is, is just so obvious. You know, it's a no-brainer. Um, so in this session today, we're going to be looking at how to integrate trees into livestock systems, the importance for animal welfare, how they buffer extreme weather patterns, and also how they can feed into making your, your livestock system more resilient in terms of providing homegrown feed. Um, so we have three speakers. We lost one on the way, so we were supposed to have four, but poor Socrates has come down with COVID. Um, he's really sad to miss all this, and I know he would have enjoyed it. Um, but what he did for us is he did a, a screencast of his presentation, so he's recorded that. We're not going to show it today, but it will be available online, and I really encourage you to watch that when it's available. It's all about condensed tannins. Um, it's quite technical, but it, it really shows the role of condensed tannins and what that can do within um, woody material and woody feed uh, for livestock systems. So I'll stop waffling on, and we'll, we'll, we'll carry on. Um, so first up will be Lindsay uh, from the Organic Research Centre, or Min, as she is to friends and family. Um, who will be given more on the kind of technical background on um, what trees can do in terms of buffering um, and providing shade and shelter. And then we've got two farmers. So we've got Henry from Lee Worthy Manor uh, Farm, and then we've got Jeremy from Forces Farming Limited, and they'll be talking more about the kind of practical experience of integrating trees and livestock, um, the benefits that they've seen, and uh, hopefully some of the challenges as well in terms of the practical application. So I'll hand over now to Lindsay just to say we'll take all the questions at the end. So please make a note if anything comes to mind and we'll have the roving mics at the end of the presentations. Okay. Hi. Great to be here and glad to see there's so many people interested in the benefits of trees for livestock. So uh, before I start talking about the trees themselves, I just want to say what we mean when we talk about animal welfare. Really, these are animals that are... With good animal welfare, these are animals that are in balance. So they're experiencing homeostatic equilibrium. If we break that down into the components of what animal welfare includes, this is physiological health, which is beyond the absence of disease. This is good, functioning, thriving animals. We also mean emotional health where they have good social relationships, they can um, function as individuals, and they can function well in the landscape that they live in. On top of those two components, of course, we've also got natural behavior, so they're interacting with their landscape, accessing what they want and what they need at the point that they need these things. So these three components, when they are fulfilled, you can say with some assuredness that these animals are experiencing good welfare. There's a lot of focus on carbon and other molecules, and the sad fact is that we have to now focus at this molecular level because of the imbalances that we've caused in these systems. One good piece of news is that the silvopastoral system looks to be one of the best sequesters of carbon. So that's one good narrative for having trees in the landscape. So when we talk about social behavior, the emotional welfare, this is very strongly linked to animals interacting with each other in a meaningful way. In hierarchical systems, a level of aggression is perfectly normal, where introduced animals are finding their position in a social uh, setting, or where you've got evenly matched animals jostling for dominance in that setting. So that element of aggression is a normal part of their behavioral patterns. But social harmony is maintained through animals being able to respect personal space, 
and also through social grooming, which is a really important element, and particularly for cattle. So if we see the differences in social licking behaviour between open pasture and silvipastoral systems, we find social licking to be about 40% of all social interactions on open pasture, but this raises to nearly 80% in a silvopastoral system. There's less fear, there's less aggression, and there's more social cohesion. The animal that's being licked also experiences a reduction in heart rate, further uh, bringing lower stress, if you like, for this animal. And there is some evidence that human-animal relationships are also improved in these systems, with animals showing less fear and less aggression, so promoting human-animal interactions and reducing the risks of any dis uh, injury to both parties. So I talked about uh, the heart rate being lowered when animals are licking each other. Heart rate is also reduced when animals are rubbing, so that it's offering a similar beneficial effect in, uh, to their emotional state. We spend time every single day on body care. We don't really think about it, but animals do the same too. And when we think about why they're doing it, it becomes very obvious why this is an important behavior to engage in. If you think about skin as your frontline defense against disease, it makes very good sense to look after it. And by rubbing, these animals can remove external parasites, they can remove seeds that might penetrate the skin, they're removing dead hair, dead skin, dirt, and by removing these elements, it also helps them to regulate their body temperature. Now, I put an image of um, a hen, uh, sorry, a cockerel in here as well to demonstrate that although birds are not using these structures directly to rub against, they are showing more preening behavior, more body care under canopy. By offering a variety of angles, you can see that animals are utilizing this to access most body parts, and thus giving themselves an overall um, body care regime. So when we talk about uh, stress uh, and welfare, we're also talking about how they use energy and what state they're in, in terms of whether they're using energy to thrive or they're using energy to cope. And much of this is about in intake versus outtake. So when we talk about an animal in its thermoneutral zone, we're talking about animals that are able to maintain their body temperatures through passive heat production, if you like. This is the heat production they're using to maintain body temperature comes as a byproduct from normal metabolic rhythms. Once they're starting having to manage this actively, they are no longer in their thermoneutral zone. So they're having to eat more, they're, having, they're starting to shiver, they're stopping eating if it's too hot. So all of these things come outside of their thermoneutral zone. So if you see these things happening, you know that this animal is no longer in a comfortable thermal state. So you can see within the thermoneutral zone, there's also a thermal comfort zone. And just outside of this, there are two areas where the animals are starting to change their behavior patterns. So they're starting to recognize that they're coming to that lower or upper critical temperature beyond which they're not able to maintain thermal neutrality. This is where they change their behaviors, but this is not eating, this is moving to shade or shelter because the response is immediate. When you start to look at food as a way of maintaining thermal comfort, there's a delayed response with this. And so necessarily, this comes as a second line behavior. So it's perhaps unsurprising, given the consequences of cold stress on young animals, that much of the focus has been on this stage of life. And perhaps we're all familiar with losses of lambs, which can be around 30% to hypothermia, although I should add that this is combined with starvation. They typically go together. And we can see that in research that's been done around the world, by offering good, meaningful shelter to lambing ewes, you can 
raise the survival rate by th at least 30%, with some uh, studies showing that this is 60% and beyond. But of course, this depends on the conditions that the animals are being asked to lamb in in the first place, and perhaps whether that is an appropriate breed for that situation. So you have to take all these things into consideration. But certainly, the, the normal um, response is that you can increase lamb survival by around 30% uh, in UK conditions. And this is perhaps unsurprising when you think that a lamb has minimal reserves to generate heat. Its body is wet, it's not able to generate heat itself, and it can lose up to 10 degrees in the first half hour of life. So offering shelter, coupled with good mothering behavior, getting that animal licked and dry, getting it to stand up and feed is critical. Shelter also helps with mother you bonding, uh, mother lamb bonding, sorry. And by encouraging them to stay within the sheltered area, you can improve them, the bonding between the two, which in turn increases lamb survival at weaning. So considering the ewe's needs is also important. If she has too far to go to access food and water, she will leave the shelter and she will take the lamb with her as a follower species, the lamb will follow. So by encouraging the ewe to stay at least one day for singles, up to three days for triplets, then you increase lamb survival also uh, at weaning. There's perhaps less focus on cattle, but within the cattle, the, the focus is largely on dairy animals. And some of the research done here, particularly for artificially fed animals, where perhaps food intake is regulated more severely, um, a lot more focus has been done on, on thermal regulation. So remember I said that when a, a calf is shivering, they've, they've moved beyond the point of thermal neutra neutrality, but this has taken them as a measure of how to protect them, if you like. So a normal dairy calf will start to shiver at around three degrees. That's their lower critical temperature. So around three degrees for a dry calf, they are not now able to cope in the conditions, thermally not able to cope in the conditions that they are living in. If you add water into the mix, so that animal is wet, you can add another 10 degrees onto that lower critical temperature. And if the animal is maintained in a system where it's food restricted, then the lower critical temperature is climbing up to 20 degrees. So shelter becomes even more critical for these animals. If you've got jerseys, you can add another five degrees onto that too. So thinking about shelter and the need for shelter in these systems becomes ever critical. Now I've added this photograph. It's pretty shocking. There is a cow under there somewhere. This is not the UK, this is North America. But when we're talking about welfare systems, yes, the animal is alive, but I'm not sure that anybody could claim that there is remotely anything like normal welfare, never mind positive welfare in this scenario. And so I just wanted to point out that we have a duty of care to our animals, even though we're trying to manage them in a more enriched landscape outside, there is still an element of, of duty of care that, that we need to offer them. And if you look at any of the basic guidelines for animal welfare, you'll see even in the five freedoms, thermal comfort is one of the things that we really should be providing for them. And that we can do best by offering systems with valid choices which enable the animals to choose what they need and when they need it. So I've selected a few images here where you can hopefully see that some of the animals are coping or not, and some of the animals are coping much better. So the cattle on the bottom have a relaxed body posture uh, as opposed to the cattle in the top with a very strained posture. What we're, what we're seeing here is the same weather conditions. So I'm standing on a track 
looking at animals that have access to shelter in driving rain and animals that don't have access to shelter. And you can see that they're starting or they're, they're engaged with that behaviour pattern that is looking to take them to a better um, state of balance. When we uh, think of pigs, of course, these are woodland creatures, peripheral woodland creatures, and you can see this relaxed body posture of this pig able to take, um, remain active, if you like, in its, in its life rather than just coping. When you look at the sheep, on the other hand, hopefully you can see that they are not active, they are just waiting for this weather to be over. So although these are self-shedding sheep, when we think about the lower critical temperatures of sheep, although normally they're more robust when they have their fleece on, when they are in a shorn state, their lower critical temperature is very high at 28 degrees. So even if this is just for a short period of time, they are very uh, exposed to cold stress at this time. And if we think then uh, that normally we are shearing sheep at May time, the average temperature in May is about 16 degrees. So if we then don't offer them shelter, they are suffering from stress um, during that time. So I talked about food not being a frontline uh, response for animals. It's nevertheless important, making sure that they do have enough feed. And when we think about what cold stress can do to an animal in terms of required feed, uh, if we take an example of beef cattle, where a healthy beef animal in winter conditions, their lower critical temperature is around about the zero degrees. But if you then add water, rain into that mix, so their coat is wet, their lower critical temperature rises to around 15 and a half degrees. Now, the rule of thumb is that for every one degree they go below their lower critical temperature, they need around 2% extra feed to maintain themselves. So we're already talking over 30% extra feed. When we add wind into that mix, where the ambient temperature is being reduced, so the effective temperature is much lower, it's not difficult to get to a scenario where you're needing to feed nearly half as much again as the animal otherwise would require. So if you like, uh, an animal exposed to these conditions where it can't find shelter, its welfare is reduced, but it's also, in terms of energy, a much more inefficient system. And I wonder when we are thinking about putting in trees and the loss of productivity in terms of grass, whether it's better to look at an animal that can find some shelter that actually wouldn't need that food in the first place. So it's trading off one thing for another thing, but improving welfare while we go. So I just wanted to say one, uh, just a few things uh, about shelter and the things, the components of shelter that make it good shelter as opposed to less good shelter. So of course, when we're talking about canopies, we've got um, protection from solar radiation, some protection from rain, depending on how dense that canopy is. And when we're talking about vertical structures, really the main components that offer meaningful shelter are porosity. So the ideal is around 50% porosity, a sloping profile, and these two elements help the wind slow down and smoothly go over the shelter, so you're minimizing turbulence. At the same time, the higher the shelter is, the shelter belt, the longer it takes for the wind that goes through and the wind that goes over to meet again. So you're extending your shelter capabilities much further into the field. And just to really demonstrate what's happening with the weather, so yes, temperature matters, but I've pulled these Met Office um, slides up just to show what's happening with weather in February time. So those are the averages of temperature. So over time, you can see uh, the, the temperature, it's starting before 1890. 
So you can see the huge variation of the temperatures in February's. There is a huge amount of variation already over time, but the trend is for the temperature to rise. So we're experiencing warmer February's over time. At the same time, on the bottom, you can see the rainfall. Again, we're experiencing a lot of variation in rainfall, but the trend over time is that there is more rainfall in February. And I should say that the, um, the highest level of rainfall on record was in 2020. So it's going up. The extremes are also going up within the variation. So I also then looked at um, the Met Office um, record of wind speed, slightly different on the bottom left-hand side. Now, they don't keep this up to date, so I've added 2022 as the orange dot. And you can see in that February period, there are peak um, high winds as well. So even though the temperature is rising, we're getting more rain and we're getting more wind, which is exposing our outwintered animals to a lot more cold stress. So this shelter in the landscape is becoming increasingly relevant for them. So our weather patterns are changing, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And the Met Office are now predicting that we're getting, we are going, well, we are seven times more likely to experience extended and extreme rainfall in wintertime. And in the summertime, we're already 30 times more likely to experience a summer like 2018. And by the time we get to 2050, they're predicting that such a summer is going to happen every second year. So getting that shade and shelter into the landscape now is kind of last gasp if we want to help um, mitigate the worst of these weather patterns. So I know I focus a lot on cold stress now, but the reality is, on a global level, heat stress is the single most important thing that trees can help prevent. So what we find um, when animals are heat stressed, they start to show coping behaviors. So the first thing they do is go and seek shade. If they are in a, a good silvopastoral system, of course, access to that shade is more spread out. And we find that they are able to maintain their normal behavior patterns for more of the day. So not just maintaining food intake, but healthy rumination. They're also maintaining their production levels better. One of the good things about uh, better designed silvopastoral systems is that they are also using that landscape more evenly, so the resulting deposition of nutrients is also more evenly spread, so you tend to get less of this camping behavior. So what happens when an animal can't avoid heat stress? Well, they start to close down systems, systems that aren't crucial for survival. So when they move away from that mild heat stress and into more moderate and severe heat stress, they are closing down their um, reproductive tract. And that has a knock-on effect on fertility. It has a knock-on effect on disrupted fetal development. And such, Particularly if a cow is suffering from heat stress in the last trimester, she will throw a smaller calf. Her, the quality of the colostrum is impaired. Actually, in general, the quality of milk is impaired. So as humans drinking this milk, we have an inferior product that we're drinking. And the negative knock-on effects of this can be measured into the third generation beyond this cow. So it has a really big negative impact on the dairy animal uh, industry. When she closes down her food systems, she's redirecting that blood away from the digestive tract and moving it out to the skin to cool herself down. But that leaves the digestive tract permeable. This is normally a non-permeable membrane, but now it's become permeable, which means that toxins that you naturally find in the gut are being excreted or, or leaking into the blood system, which can then trigger an inflammation cascade. And measures have been shown that animals, cows, dairy cows suffering from heat stress, 
will get more mastitis as a consequence. So really a lot of negative effects from this. Yeah, I just wanted to just really end on this because you know we're really trying to understand how hot is too hot, what is uh, the thermal, uh, how do we maintain animals in a, in a thermal neutral state? Well, I have to say that, of course, that, that in itself is a movable feast depending on breed, depending on um, production levels, um, partly to do with acclimatization, so you can acclimatize to hotter and colder conditions. Now, all of these things play their part. Health also plays a part on um, tolerance. So traditionally, we've used the temperature humidity index, which is pretty much what it says it is. It measures temperature, it measures humidity, and then it looks at the effects of that on production. And it's come up with these measures of stress, not based on the animal, but based on the consequences of production. When we start to include the animal, so the equivalent temperature uh, index for dairy cows, they have taken some animal measures. And you can see that they are experiencing stress earlier than the temperature humidity index predicts. So some of you might have read the quote from me that animals in mild heat stress are already uh, losing three liters of milk in their production every day. The reality is it's not mild stress. It's already uh, moderate stress. So the challenge for us is to better understand actually when these animals are in a stressed condition. But what I would say that even when we do understand it, we're still going to have to come back to a point where we're offering them conditions that do buffer them. So we still come back to this. We may have the knowledge, but we still have to offer them these systems in which they are able to thrive um, comfortably. Great. Thanks very much, Min. Um, I'd like to welcome up Henry. I'd just like to introduce yourself. Um. I'm uh, I'm Henry. I farm down in in, in, in Devon. Um, I started farming by myself nine years ago. I previously farmed with my father in a very intensive system. Um, we had a few a few a few. Uh, disagreements and we thought we'd I'd, I'd try and do my own thing um, and I went along the similar vein uh, I, we found a farm with which, which, which was a 120 acres fairly poor state um, I decided that I had to maximize my my, my, my my earnings as quickly as possible so I went down a suckler booby fruit so we were finishing uh, bull beef off at, at uh, 12 months old, 12 months old, 400 kilos, average live weight. But we were using about 10 kilos of concentrated day. Um, we also had six, 60 cows, so massively overstocked. Uh, so a huge, um, hu a, a huge reliance on on fertilizer, cake bills, bought and feed. And then it all, it all came unstuck. We we in nine months we lost a third of our of our breeding females to TB. Um, on one day we lost ten eight month olds in uh, um, in calf cows. So we then had a situation where our cash flow was was uh, was dramatically reduced, and it was um, fighting for and we, and we had to fight to stay on the farm. So. I then decided we'd go to a very extensive system. Um, so uh, we reduced the stocking um, massively. I thought, well, we've spread huge amounts of nitrogen. We've had huge concentrate bills. Let's try and do as, as little as possible. So um, I was doing some research, thought agroforestry would be a, a good way. But I've always maintained that the profit and loss account has to has to be the top of your priorities. I mean, it's, it, it, it's no good farming for nature or, or or trying to farm if you aren't keeping the bank manager happy. So 
Um, so, so, so my priority on, on, on a resilient system is, is uh, profit and loss accounts, welfare, and then the environment. But all three points actually work very well. It, 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 it's a very nice mix. And um, so, the, so the economic side, I wanted a lower cost, less cash out, but try and maintain, um, maintain output. Um, output hasn't, I'll be brutally honest, hasn't been maintained. Um, but, but, but the profit and loss account has, uh, has, actually, um, has, actually, uh, has actually improved. So, so, so we are bringing less in, but, let, but less is going out. So where we were producing 400, 400 kilo animals, huge cape bills, we're now producing 350 kilo animals, 20 months old. The, the, the grades have dipped. We've gone so from, from e, e grades, U grades, down to um, O grades occasionally. So, I mean, our, 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 our um, my, my, my Instagram account has got less, less bragging on my grades, but um, so, 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 so that's a key. And um, the brilliant thing about a Sylvia Carter scheme is it, it ticks all the boxes. So, We've got a mixture of of, of, um, of, of old old coppice, which we've grazed. We've also put in um, new planting, so we've planted five thousand trees over the last three years. Um, so here here we are in a old 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 coppice system. Um, so so, um, so 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 we so, so, so we have this coppice system in, in here, which is as you can see has been managed for many years. It had been fenced off; the stock weren't uh, allowed in it. We now. Have taken all down all fencing. That was about five years ago. Um, we've then. I don't think. I, I think I focus on my, on, my, on my video with all the pictures. So you, you, so you have to use imagination. Um, we then we then introduced a a, um, a a plant design like Helen Brownies outside. So we've got so we split um, larger fields in, 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 in into strips. Um, so so in that we've <laughs> implemented a. A um, block block grazing system. We found, I think, the biggest put off for farmers is when they when you talk about trees, you think you're going to lose l lose outputs, l lose production, lose field space. With with the um, with, with the avenue planting system, we've actually found that we've maximised uh, grazing output. We've got a 15 acre field. We've had 20 cows and their, and their followers in this 15-acre field since April, and they're still in there, in, in there today. They're just doing a continuous um, virtuous cycle. So it also helps me massively. I've, I've got to do a lot less work. Um, unfortunately, I'm, I sp that means I spend more, more time at home. Um, but it, it's, I, I think we, we really have to see it as, as a... As, as a as a perfect, um, I, I don't really like the word holistic, but it really helps me with the with, with the with the economics, welfare, and environment. So, um, on the welfare side of things, we have got open fields with with no cover, which I like to rectify. Um, we've also got close cost copy systems like these, and then we've also got three-year-old plantings, which um, which we can't I, I I can't really pass much judgment on yet, but. We've last year during the during the during the drought, we had cattle which had access to the coppice and cattle which had no no, no access to shade. For the breeding stock, we have two different mobs. Um, I've got uh, but the bull goes in exactly the same time. We found that the that our calving block was up to three weeks um, longer with the cows which were in open pasture as the ones which had access to shade. And the same also goes through our, for, for, for our weight gain, so we're, so, so we're um, weighing, the, weighing the young stock. We found the young stock during the, the, the really a high heat of last year were averaging half a kilo a day weight, weight gain. And then the stock, like, like the ones in the photo, they were going up to uh, 1.15, 1.5, and that's just on 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 a on a, on a browse and grazing. So, I think sometimes we worry about cash flow 
and, and look too much into what's going out. But it's what's going behind the scenes. It's, it, it's, um, it's if, especially amongst, uh, I mean, it's not much of a, an issue on my, on my, on my small scale, but if, if you're a large dairy herd and you're, lo and you're losing two, 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 two weeks of, 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 that, of, that, uh, of that cow next getting to calf, it's, it's a big issue. Um, we've also noticed that um, minerals are a huge, a huge plus side. We've, um, we, 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 as you know, we, we went down massive with TB, so there's, uh, there's issues like, uh, like uh, supplementary feeding and, and minerals with badger access. We found that the, the, that the cattle who had access to the coppice and, 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 were, and were browsing the trees, they we had some tested, their, their base um, blood results were dramatically better than the ones which, which are in open pasture. It also, it, it's, it's also on, on, on other aspects of welfare, so we'd, uh, this year we tested um, the faecal accounts for, 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 for worms. We found that the, that the cattle grazing the, the tannin-rich trees had zero faecal egg count, whereas the ones in op an open pasture had a very high, high egg count. Um, we, so we try and rotate the cattle now in, 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 into the trees, so, so we're so, so, so reducing our, our medical costs by, by putting poor on. And... Um, so it's 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 all the underlying issues which you can't see and aren't immediately obvious, but they're so critical. We also haven't had to use antibiotics for 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 for, for, for the last for the last two years. Um, actually, we used it once last year, but that's because I had a hard carving and that was my fault because uh, a, a heifer got in which shouldn't have got in. So so we've so. And, and our, 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 our lameness has gone down dramatically. So we've got really high willow, uh, willow content in, in our woods. Willow is an absolute magical tree for, 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 uh, for, 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 for self-medication. Um, so you have antifungal properties. It's a, it's a pain relief. It's anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. Um, so, so, so you almost find that cattle. We, we, we've noticed that cattle they sort of they sort of uh, they they browse trees when they need to and and, and when they're stressed. And the other thing I'd, I'd I'd urge farmers to do is just take the time to look at their cattle, look at their stock. I mean, it's no. I, I, when when I was when I was a bit, a bit um, busy and trying to try and bring in as much money as possible. I just give everything a, 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 cursing, a, a cursory glance, but actually just spend time to sit down, watch, watch what they're doing, what they're eating, what, if you've got hedgerows, what, what hedgerow plants they, uh, are they eating, are, they, are their ears pricked up, are they, are, are they, are they scared of you? Because uh, on to L L Lindsay's point, we, um, we've noticed that even with our new plant plantings and, and the avenues of trees, that they almost feel secure with these with these funny upright stakes and tubes in the ground, it sort of break, breaks up the environment because cattle aren't designed to be a a a, 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 um, a open pasture um, a, 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 a animal. It's something that we've we've created. They're actually a, a, a woodland animal, and, and they need they need and thrive on that on that protection. Uh, so the environment. Um, uh, I say that's lowest on my <laughs> on my priorities. Of course, I'm concerned about the environment. But I, I think to have a thriving environment and a thriving farm, they 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 they, they have to be on the, on the equal footing. There's no, there's no point having a, a, a thriving environment and not there to manage it. So um, we've noticed that the that the biodiversity since we've put more more attention to the trees has actually has actually shot up. We've got cuckoos on the farm which you never had before. We've got um, great grey partridge because we've got more 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 ground cover. Um, Soil is 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 is, is, uh, is another uh, hot topic, especially carbon carbon content. So three years ago, we took a base baseline in our tree plantings, a bit before the tree plantings are done, to take a baseline of carbon and see how how, is, um, how how that could be improved. 
We've also noticed that um, during drought and flood, our, 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 our grass, grassland is, 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 re is remarkably better, even through the three-year-old plantings with the, with the, uh, with, with the, the roots doing their, their wonders. I mean, of course, they're, 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 they're downsized. First year I planted the new, new trees, I felt like topping them a few times. Um, especially when you've got cows escaping and things and sort of tra trampling things and so you've got, it's just, it's, it's, it, it, it's a proper mindset change and you have to, it, even when I was fully on board with it, it's very hard going from a, going from a conventional farmer to then planting trees and, and you do, and you do think, have I done the right thing? Second year, easier. This year, third year, I, I, I can, it's, it's so much better. Everything's changing. Everything's reacting nicely. Um, I do apologise. I feel like this has been a very massive ramble. But um, <laughs> yes, I think that's my two minutes up. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Thanks very much, Henry. And now I'll pass over to Jeremy. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you um, for the invitation to share a little bit about what I've done for the last two or three years, um, three seasons, sort of two and a half years. Um, as the slide suggests, trees and livestock. Um, I've pretty much, I guess for, since about 2020, um, been incorporating willow trees into the diet of sheep, cattle. Um, originally down in Hampshire, I'll talk about that in a moment, and now moved up towards um, Shrewsbury on some very, very heavy clay. So the introduction of willow, willow planting, things like that is getting more and more interesting as we um, go across the country. But um, where did the idea come from for me? Um, I started my journey into sheep with orphan lambs, as a lot of people do. Um, Google, in April 2021, I had a look and uh, up came... Willow leaves from all three locations provide sheep with the zinc and cobalt, and that was my start into the journey of willow incorporating that into sheep's diet. Um, as I went through, came across Nigel Kendall when I was over at uh, one of the grounds. Well, I think it was 2021 again, um, and then also yourself, Lindsay, listened to you at grounds. Well, and that was again what grew my interest and grew my. I guess, passion and, uh, and, and sort of where we are today. So pretty much orphan lambs, started feeding them ad lib, April, saw them nibbling it, saw them eating it, carried on feeding it to them, realised that not, worm it, not worming these lambs, they're growing very, very well, they're finishing quite nicely, and that led me into finding some official information about it and not just being a farmer that likes to uh, incorporate trees into, into livestock. Um, so what have I seen? I've seen that picture's just moved a little bit, unfortunately, but um, as mentioned before, improved um, daily live weight gains. So had lambs um, over the last couple of years that we can get by doing the work and feeding lambs willow, you can get up to sort of 40 kilos, 42 kilos by early August. That addition of cobalt and zinc into the diet and the... Um, the contribution that helps to is it vitamin B12, remind me, development that the cobalt's adding into the diet. So, but that element of including that in the diet, I, I can say hand on heart confidently that the number of lambs I've had with mucky back ends needing to be looked at, needing to be brought in, I'm only lambing 50 or so a year, but knowing that willow is having a massive impact when I'm weaning them. The other thing um, I'll come back to as well is um, enrichment. So taking willow out, I've got some bits down there on the floor. That's literally what I was dropping yesterday on the floor to the lambs. Even just branches lying like that on the floor, lambs will go over, they'll pick it up, they'll nibble it. If you get to the point where you've got willow that you can take down and it's bigger and it's the height of this and you drop it and there's branches that they can nibble on, sheltering under those branches, to me, especially in lambs, adds a massive amount of security. So you start walking around a field, you see lambs in the middle of a pasture, First thing to do is flock together. If you start putting objects in there, like willow, things like that, branches and stuff, they start to be a bit more secure, a little bit less panic when anyone comes in. Um, but also what I see is even through the winter months, when I'm returning back to the grazing where I've dropped willow branches like that, if I haven't flailed it and moved it and chopped it, if they're bigger, what you'll see through the winter is as well, as they're getting a nutrition requirement, they'll go back and they'll nibble the bark off and they'll literally strip 
dry willow that you put in there last summer. So the enrichment. Um, the other thing I noticed, as you can see on the slide behind me, is they do actually start to look for tree fodder. So the picture of the lambs in the bottom right-hand side there, that was the second time that they'd had, la had willow taken into them. They were born in April. Um, literally, driving there with a quad bike, start chucking it out. A few of them come over, start nibbling it. You can hear the sounds. They all start shouting. This is pretty good. This is, we, you, you all need some of this. You go in there the second time, they all start flocking over. The other reason I like it is because anyone that has any sheep, you start to interact more with your lambs. If you're chucking willow down here and they're you to me away, I can see if there's any problems in a lot of my stock by changing the habits and changing the nutrition and what I'm doing with them. So that, I know it's only a small flock, but it's August. It's that sort of time when generally shepherd's workload can be starting to reduce. The inclusion of willow to me, it, um, it works really, really well. Um, worming frequency, you touched on that, Henry. Uh, I've got ewes that will be into their third year of lambing next year, um, the orphan lambs I started with. Again, hand on heart, I can tell you I've wormed some of those ewes once. They, they build up the resilience. Whether it's in their gut, whether it's in their blood, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. But all I can say is from my experience, the use of wormers, I, I rarely even go in the medicine cabinet to get any kind of wormer out because I'm actively including willow in the diet and it's in the used diet as well. Um, drought resistance, the picture on the left-hand side, that was actually taken in August last year, so the middle of um, summer last year when we had not much grass around. Had about 20 or so cattle that had pretty much free range of um, some very old and quite derelict uh, water meadows. Now, what was interesting there is willow had gone absolutely crazy. It had fallen over. Now, to say that that tree, it doesn't really do it representation on the screen there, but that's a willow, bee, willow branch about that big. So follow it out towards the edge of there. Those cattle were pulling bark off about two, two and a half meters tall. If anyone walks out to any willow trees now, I challenge you, rip off a chunk of bark with your teeth, or one set of teeth, <laughs> chew it, and then try and, try and digest it. The, the rumen function of those animals to eat that bark is unbelievable. After that um, summer drought, obviously they're all piling in under the willows. What we then could, were able to do was actually start to restore some of the meadows, start to cut out some of the willow that the cattle had naturally selected and broken down. Um, and quite honestly, willow without any bark on it makes absolutely fantastic firewood. Just be careful putting it in a uh, log burner because it does crack and pop. So, um, But from a feeding perspective, the inclusion and the shading and everything like that and the enrichment and when we start to hit times of drought, um, I can only say that including even dropping and cutting willow like that has extended the um, partial recovery times as well. So that final point that comes off there, what I wanted to talk about there is that gives me the, the possibility to extend the grazing, team, grazing time per paddock. So if I want to push them a little bit harder, rather than try and keep them inside an electric fence, I know that I can chuck them a good load of willow and they'll stay in there probably two, three, four days longer. That's exactly what I did yesterday. Took them a load of willow. I know that they'll be settled. I know they're not going to be looking to start to jump out the wire and start to go through. A um, little bit of feeding frequency in terms of um, ewes and lambs and things like that. So April to May, pretty much as soon as it's coming out in leaf, um, I'll be selectively maybe taking some willow. Um, one of the interesting things is obviously bird nesting season. How do we harvest a tree fodder if it's bird nesting season? So. We, I knew that there were certain areas on there that I'd coppiced and keep, um, keep going back to. Through May and June, um, mainly browsing, as I said before, and then July, um, and then into August, the main thing there was really cut and drop for lambs, as you can see on the picture on the left, literally. Quad bike trailer full of willow. Um, and the one thing that I'd say about that and where I get pretty much all of my willow from now is out of hedges that are going to be flailed. To me, having a willow that can put on two, two and a half metres of biomass that can be eaten by an animal that has health benefits, to flail that is criminal. So that's leading me on to other projects that I'm looking at in terms of how do we harvest this stuff like that and, and then store it and then process it or make it available in other months. Um, some very farmer results, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, but um, April-born lambs weaned in August, um, sitting around about 42 to 53 kilos. Now, that's a twin. Not those two twins underneath there, but that is just a representation of about 
two weeks after weaning, you can keep the condition of the lambs. That's what I'm aiming to do, and that's the mindset sort of shift that I've tried to make with incorporating trees, is try and be a bit more proactive. I was watching a video the other day, um, a shepherd on YouTube that was going off to sell, I think it was five or six lambs to then spend that money on wormer to then treat the rest of the lambs. Now, to me, I, if they were my lambs, I know it's a different scale, but if you can get to the mindset of, right, if I can harvest a load of willow, if I know there's a high egg count, if I'm expecting, suspecting a high egg count, start piling the willow in there. Generally, they will sort themselves out. You'll start to see that maybe you can selectively worm, maybe you can start to actually tre test a batch of lambs that you're only feeding willow to. So, um, but overall, something I've been doing for about three years, and I would, um, if you can do it, just maybe give it a trial. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in terms of ewe condition, so feeding um, ewes, willow, and giving them access to, 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 um, to any other tree forage, to me, it keeps them in top condition. Um, the zinc in there keeps the teeth healthy, keeps the feet healthy, and overall condition of those sheep, that's what I'm trying to say, is with the willow and with the inclusion of tree fodder, it's trying to keep them in that high health sort of area. Um, Last winter, I did actually do a trial of um, willow hay. So literally chopped it down mid-August, as you can see there, hung it up, bunched it together, literally dried it, dried it out. Thing is, if you dry it out in direct sunlight, the leaves will go crispy and probably blow away within two or three days. So the idea of actually hanging it in the top of sheds where you've got reasonable airflow but no light, quite a high temperature, the whole drying of it is another element completely. One thing I did learn is actually rats love dried willow. So I came into the winter, came a load to pull out a load of bunches and they actually disturbed a load of rats. Whether it's the smell, whether it's the flavor, I don't know. But either way, again, I mentioned some of the ewes that I've wormed once maybe. Um, that inclusion of it in the ring feeder in the winter, it, they, again, it's something else, it's something different in their diet. They go in, they nibble it, they eat the dry leaves. And I tell you what, even if you pull the sticks out after that, they will go in and they will eat and they'll literally clear the bottom of that ring feeder finding those leaves. So it does work. It's a little bit more um, work in terms of maybe adjusting how, um, how the animals are managed. Um, and then before I talk about my sort of next steps, if you like, my sort of where I'm going next, just wanted to talk about um, livestock rearing and recovery. Um, for me, it's massive. So the cow that's on the, on the left-hand side of the slide there, she's been in the shed for about, since about the 30th of July with a broken leg. Um, she's turning, well, she's not that she was wild anyway, but she's one of the most docile cows I've ever had or known in the shed. And the recovery of her broken leg has been absolutely outstanding. So what I mean I've got there, you can see it on the screen, literally the bucket of water in the corner, stand the willow in it. They, she'll browse that for, I don't know, two or three hours. So again, rather than just sat in the pen, chuck her a bucket of concentrates, fill up her water, give her hay, that inclusion, it might take me, I don't know, half an hour in total, stop on the way home, snip a few bits of willow off the hedge, bundle them up. But overall for her health and welfare, that is making a huge difference. And what we got in the bottom is once the willow's done, I'll strip a bit of willow off, strip a little bit of leaf off, strip a bit of bark off, leave it in the water, the cows, she will always drink that blue bucket of water that's got that willow bark in, regardless if there's another two or three buckets, she won't touch the other ones. So I'm sure that even if you've got a sick pen, if you've got sick animals, just start chucking willow in that water trough or in their water or include it in the pen. I guarantee you, and I've done this, for example, with the sheep on the left, you can go and find a ewe that's down, miserable, might not be wanting to carry on. Chuck a bit of willow in front of her and she'll go, oh, actually, maybe it is worth living for. I... <laughs> I would just say it's worth trying and it's such a useful product. And then the third one in the middle is um, a couple of calves that I'm rearing. So the Belty Galloway there, she was rejected by her mum, so she's in being um, hand reared. But that inclusion of willow in their diet, even at that age of drinking milk, to watch them finish a bottle of milk and rather than go and suckle on each other's navels and navels and whatnot, they'll go and they'll try and find a leaf and just play around with a leaf and then they'll chew the leaf, they swallow the leaf. Inclusion of, you know, willow and stuff like that and trees into carve housing and things like that to me is just just absolutely, um, I wouldn't say essential, but to me it makes a big difference, especially on the health and welfare side. And knowing how much, let's say, um, how many benefits there are in willow itself, it's logical that um, we should be trying to make it more accessible throughout the year. So where I'm going next, um, 
I'm trying to look at how can I harvest bundles of willow, how can I dry them, potentially um, looking and discussing with a couple of people, um, Lindsay and I were discussing it the other day, looking at this uh, short rotation coppice, could we harvest it and bundle it and actually get a second crop out of the biomass planting in terms of a forage crop in between two biomass crops. The, the potential is there, it's a huge opportunity. Um, and then the other thing that I'm investigating at the moment is looking into pelletizing willow. Um, because to me, one of the worst things I do, and I'm sorry if there's anyone here from Mole Valley or wherever we are, but I hate going to Mole Valley and I hate buying bags of concentrates and I hate buying bags of feed. If I can find a way to start to pelletize willow and it still have that feed quality in it in a willow pellet, then that's a huge potential for going forward in terms of alternative feed for livestock. So that would be me. I probably rattled through that, but I hope that gives us a bit of time for questions. Thanks very much, Jeremy, and thanks to all our speakers. Um, I think we've only got about 10 minutes for questions, um, but please wait for the roaming mics. There's one just behind you there. Hi there. Uh, really good talks, guys. I just had a question because there's, uh, there's been a lot of talk about willow. Uh, we farm about half an hour from here. We've got um, free-draining chalk soil, and uh, willow doesn't grow very well where we are. Would you recommend anything else which would be an alternative to willow, which would provide the benefits you've been talking about? Yeah, I might as well say something. Um, well... Uh, there is a lot of focus on willow, and rightly so, but willow is not the only plant. It, it's attractive because it's fast-growing, and it has a reputation for being high in salicin, for example, the painkiller. Uh, it's got good levels of tannin, and it's got good nutrient overall, so as a fodder, but it's not exclusive to willow, so it's fine if you have other plants. The, the, all of those components are going to be there, but I would recommend having a mix anyway, because many of these trees will have different levels of nutrients in them and at different times of year. So trying to cover, for example, um, Jeremy talked about zinc um, and cobalt in the willow. Well, it's always high in, in willows because they're an accumulator of those minerals, but it's not necessarily high in every mineral. So getting, getting a good mix in is is the best way forward. Um, and actually starting with the trees that do grow well in your landscape. Lady down here in pink. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, we grow lots of willow, and we have coppice willows around ponds recently to let it lay into the pond. And last summer, the, the summer drought, we had loads of coppicing because we could get into the ponds. I was worried at that stage that these cows who hadn't had access to willow, suddenly, if I let them into this these piles of willow tops, it would be too much in one go, like kids in a sweetie shop. Do you think that was a fair worry, or should I let them just go through it? Can they have too much in mm, one go? Not, not, not in my experience. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I generally anyway, I think if you put cows out into a field, they'll go and eat what they want anyway. Um, but no, I've never seen any negative effects with them, let's say. Overdosing on willow, no. Um, the only thing I would say is, in that respect, in terms of feeding a lot of willow, is... It, it is a natural high. Uh, generally, the cow that was in the slide, the one with the broken leg, part of me feeding her a lot of willow is to keep her calm and to keep her, not sedated, but keep her relatively happy inside. So but that's the only thing I can think of. Well, one thing I would add to that is um, just being mindful of time of year. Um, I think that's right. Uh, certainly in drought conditions, animals can transfer to high levels of of fodder, tree fodder as opposed to grasses um, and be fine. The ruminant is a very effective uh, machine, if you like, and, it, and it, it digests leaf just as well as it does grass, even though it's primarily um, meant for grazing, if you like, uh, digestion. But there are a few things to consider. So um, I've come across in, in an old book, actually it's a British poisonous plant, and it it mentions ash. And it's not because ash is poisonous per se. And, and in fact, historically, ash and elm were our two key uh, fodder trees. But there was a point back in the days when most farms had woodlands, there would be a practice of sending in the cattle to pick up the fallen ash leaves in a wood. So this was normal practice. 
But if they took on too much of that, if you like, late, late season, high lignin, so high structure um, food, then you could cause um, the gut would stop, so compacted gut. Uh, and in this book, it's called Wood Evil. So it can happen, but I think that's a very specific time frame to be careful about content uh, or yeah, portion having, allowance, if you like. Them as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a gentleman there. Um, yeah, just an observation initially. Um, turning livestock into aftermath, after silage or hay, the first thing the older generation do, cattle or, or, or sheep, is run around the hedgerows. And you wonder, what, what are they doing when they've got all this less grass? But, um, they're going and nibbling at different species, obviously. Um, the, the main part of my question is, uh, there was mention about live weight gain and, uh, uh, and uh, finishing by, but also, Henry, I think you mentioned about the loss of grade status down to U's and O's. Um, but have you followed the carcass through to um, marbling and flavour and, and talked to butchers about actually what could be a positive aspect of uh, changing? Um, I admit I did try a direct farm to customer meat, beef, beef box um, sales but um, I, I, I didn't do very well at it so I stopped but um, um, so all the cattle we sell goes straight to 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 um, to, to uh, um, Dumbia and on to um, 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 m &S. but I, I can't talk about the marbling but our condemnation reports on on liver fluke on on other um or on other um issues which which um which get, get condemned for they've they have been markedly reduced but um, i'm afraid i can't comment on 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 marbling and actual meat quality the um only thing i'd say is i've got some they're jacob cross so they're reasonably marbled anyway they don't get a layer of fat on them should we say but the feedback I've had in terms of those and the lambs that I have killed and sold directly out of those was they did have very, very good marbling. And if I thought about it, I probably should have put a picture in of, of the meat that um, in the presentation. But I, I would say it does because it's a steadier growth of the meat with all the nutrients it requires. So, Another question, uh, gentleman down here in the green. Hi, thanks for that. Um, just wondering, with the uh, like newly planted trees, if you are looking to introduce agroforestry elements. Uh, with livestock, like how many years would you keep those trees protected from the animals uh, before you can really let the let the cows and sheep in there? Well, so, so on our farm, we've got two 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 different planting planting designs. We got the 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 um, Aiza trees. I simply just fenced um, a meter each side of each or or of the standards. Um, kept kept electric fencing uh, just above knee high um, knee knee height and uh, hip height. Um, so. Uh, this year, the cattle have started um, browsing some of the shrubs which have which have um, grown in the fence. So it's, it's, a, it's a browsing some of the, the hazel and the and the uh, and the and the uh, willow, and surprising enough, some, some of the thorn. Um, so on that system, I've I in, I integrated the cattle on on, on a, um, a day one. So there's been no loss of or 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 production. Um, but then, with sorry, sorry, there's, Lindsay gets very, very upset when I use the wrong terms. Um, living barn, green barn, living barn. So, 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 living barn, which to me is just a shelter belt. But don't say that's Lindsay. No. Oh. Uh, can I just defend myself here? <laughs> I, I do actually object to things being called a barn when they don't offer the things that a barn offers. Oh, sorry, it's a shelter belt, not living barn, wasn't it? So if it's a shelter belt, I'd actually prefer it be called a shelter belt because it just misrepresents what's being offered to the animal if you call it something it's not. So. Sorry, okay. <laughs> Glad to clear that. Um, so, yeah, so on, on the shelter belts, um, we're hoping to do uh, reintroduce uh, six years, in, uh, so three years time. So we've around all the other uh, standard trees, we put um, um, thorn protection around. So we've got three three um, uh, black thorn around each each tree. Um, so that's out of production. It's also it's harder if the cattle break in because they just go on a rampage, 
Whereas at least with the alley systems, it's just one load of trees which they break the, the guards down. You have to re restake it. But um, the only thing I'd add is I, I don't know if there's enough research because so for example, if you're planting a hedge, is it actually better, as you said, Henry, to fence it, it get it established, get the roots established, and then allow it if it's a hedge plant to be grazed right back down potentially by sheep, and then encourage all of that new growth. It, is that a better management than just letting it grow up and let the whips grow as you want? I know a lot of old farmers that if they were planting a hedge after the first, after six months, you know, in the first spring, they'd let the sheep go over it quite quickly and take all that new growth off. And then it, it helps, it actually puts its roots down firmer potentially. But I, I would say I don't think there's enough uh, understanding there yet. What's the benefit? How long, should we say? Well, I just wanted to add to that as well, that it depends what you want the tree for. So if you want canopy then you do want that single stem, so you don't want that browsing down. But if you want multi-stem, then by all means. Um, there is an element of control as well with how long animals are in any given landscape. So you, even with relatively immature trees, it, it can tolerate some grazing and browsing if you sort of uh, restrict the amount of time that the animals are in that landscape. Okay, just one last question. Um, you mentioned moving away from pelletized concentrate and willow was one of the was a elements you're thinking of. What other elements could we think of when we're trying to move away? Um, so to me, one of the biggest ones would be mulberry. If we can get mulberry established or well established, as far as I understand, mulberry has more digestible protein in it than alfalfa and considerably less methane, I think. So... Mulberry trees, though, I, I was talking to someone the other day and they were saying that they're very hard to get established unless you're grafting them onto other stems. That means they're more expensive. Slugs are a problem, et cetera, et cetera. So, but mulberry, for me, would be the biggest one I'd want to look at and then probably alder and elm as well, I would imagine. So, But mulberry, to me, with a high protein content, makes a good option for a, a wider part of the industry, pigs, chickens and stuff. Well, I think you have to... Uh think about the animals themselves as well because um, with the focus on older there are lots of attributes that older has it's a nitrogen fixer it grows in pretty awful conditions but it's really quite low down on the palatability scale um, that said they do browse it it's just finding when it's most palatable and maybe mixing that in if you are going to include it in a system uh, in terms of mulberry, that's already used in systems um, in France, for example. Um, and there's a, there's a video of a French farmer demonstrating how many tons of mulberry he harvests every year for animal feed. Um, Jeremy's right, it's very high in protein. Um, it really, actually, it, nothing compares to it in terms of leaf form, uh, in terms of protein content. But the challenge is to get it to grow and the most robust um, mulberries are not the best either. It, that doesn't mean they're bad, but the absolute best. I never remember which way round, but there's a white, a red, and a black. And the most difficult to grow is also the best to grow, if you like. Um, so there are some challenges with that. Um, yeah, I had one more point. I've forgotten it. No, I was just going to add to that. I think the other thing that's not clear yet is as well is, let's say, a cutting strategy. If you've got a mulberry hedge or a willow hedge, what's the best way to harvest it, manage it? I mean, I didn't touch on this earlier, but this is basically what I do most of my agroforestry work with, is literally back the quad bike trailer up to the hedge and go round and cut off literally bits of willow like that and bits of elm like that and chuck it into um, to the livestock. But I, I've, I've been down many, many routes. I was just going to mention, um, I've put this through forage harvesters to see what comes out. I've tried to include it in silage bales. It's doing it at an achievable cost, should we say. But uh, one thing we didn't really talk about was the size of what animals will browse, which is probably about that sort of size. So about the size of your little finger. You know, cows, livestock will digest that. And if you actually put... I can show anyone afterwards if you want, but if I snip, let's say, 10 mil off of that, if you run that through your hand, it's actually very, very soft wood. If you cut it when it's green, it's actually very, very comparable to maize. So it, 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 I think it could be ensiled. It's something I've tried in the past. We're not there yet, but it's an interesting one. Sorry. <laughs> it's getting excited. Um, it's yeah. agroforestry. <laughs> uh, there's so much research that needs doing, and, and practice as well. It's not just about being in a lab. It's getting it to work on farm and understanding um, farm conditions. But um, 
currently, uh, Jeremy and I are engaged in a project trial. So this is very early stages, but Jeremy mentioned the pelleting of willow. Um, and this trial is looking at various methods of harvesting and treating willow uh, and seeing how the nutrition transfers from the harvesting through the treatment to the point of feeding uh, and looking at these different, um, the potential. And as part of that, of course, harvesting uh, and drying will have to be considered. Uh, one thing that we have maybe only just touched upon in our conversations is um, I'm then thinking about what happens to this long term. So if you've got animals that are living for up to 20 years, what then happens to their tooth wear? So I've started to investigate tooth wear of animals that are living in high treed environments. There's been some research done on red deer on this. So body condition coupled with tooth wear, depending on where they're getting their predominant food from. Um, so yeah, that's something to consider. Um, so, yeah, that research trial is actually part of a much bigger European project called ReLivestock. The logo's up there, which we're also involved in in Portugal. Um, Socrates at Reading is involved as well. Um, so it's a much broader project looking at how to increase the resilience of livestock systems right across Europe. Um, it's looking at elements of feeding, breeding, management, um, and, and measuring those as well. Um, and agroforestry is a part of that, which is great. Um, so I think I should let you go for lunch. Um, thank you so much for your engagement. Thanks for staying on. Sorry about the technical difficulties at the start. Just would like to say a big thank you to the speakers today, um, to Lindsay, to Henry, and to Jeremy. Um, thanks also to the technical team for your support and the roaming mics. And thanks to you guys for, for being here. So have a good rest of the day and enjoy your lunch. Sorry, I should just also thank Min for organising the session, Min at the Organic Research Centre, so thanks to you. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry.